All right. So again, thank you for being here. Um, this webinar today is brought to you by American Philanthropic and our Center for Civil Society. My name is John Hanna. I am the Director of Education for the Center for Civil Society. Um, we believe that uh, that uh, America's voluntary associations can improve the effectiveness of donors, charitable foundations, and nonprofit organizations. Our center fulfills its mission through education by providing research, publications, webinars, master classes, and in-person events. These resources offer practical advice, ideas, training, and tools that help civil society leaders achieve their missions. A project of American Philanthropic, our belief is that if America's voluntary organizations can more fully realize their visions, American civil society and American democracy will become healthier and American individuals and communities will more fully flourish. Again, thank you everyone for being here and um, really, really excited about today's talk. Again, we're talking about higher education, major gifts, and really excited to have two people that I've known for quite a while. I'll start by introducing Kyle. Kyle Conover serves as Associate Director of Development, Major Gifts at Stanford University. In his role, he oversees all major gift activity in Southern California and Arizona for Stanford Law School. Kyle has 14 years of fundraising experience, including extensive work in corporate and foundation relations prior to becoming a major gift officer. He earned his MBA from the University of Southern California and completed public policy degrees at Indiana University Bloomington and UC San Diego. Also joining us today, Bill Kemp, my former colleague at the University of Notre Dame. Bill Kemp joined the University of Notre Dame in 2011 as Director of Regional Development for Leadership Gifts. In his current capacity, Bill is responsible for strengthening relationships with members of the Notre Dame family who reside in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Upon completing the Reserve Officer Training Corps in the University's Air Force Attachment 225 and graduating with a degree in electrical engineering in 94, Bill served six years in the Air Force as a project manager and systems engineer in San Antonio and Los Angeles. While an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame, Bill was a member of the oldest marching band in the land and had the fine distinction of winning the Mr. Stanford contest while living on campus for all four years in Stanford Hall. So great. Thank you both for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, when I took this job with American Philanthropic about seven months ago and started thinking about these webinars and these discussions, you two were really the first two that came to mind because you just both have so much passion for what you do. Um, just the excitement and the enthusiasm whenever I talk to you guys, it's just really apparent that you really love your work. So I want to talk today about fundraising, um, especially in higher education as a vocation and also just to some, share some, um, some tips and tricks with our, with our guests today on the webinar. So I have some questions and we'll just, we'll just get right into it. And the first question, just sort of right out of the gate, and we'll start with you, Kyle, but what, what do you enjoy most about higher education fundraising? Uh, I think the two things I love most are the built-in alumni network. I've worked for non-brick and mortar um, institutions before, kind of national health organizations, and there's not that just built in network of people who already have an affinity for the university or for, for the mission. Um, and the second thing I like is the variety, um, getting to do discovery work, uh, qualification, um, just being able to travel and meet with individuals. I worked in CFR for many years where that variety wasn't quite there. Um, and so being able to work with individuals has been great for that. So those are the two things that I love the most about uh, higher ed major gifts. Great. And, and we have, so we have Kyle, who is a USC grad and works at Stanford and Bill, who is a Notre Dame grad and works at Notre Dame. So we'll try to avoid football trash talk during this webinar, but I make no promises. Bill, what do you love most about working in higher education fundraising? You've been doing it for quite a while. Well, yeah, I have done it for about 11 years. Um, I come at it from a different angle from just the professional in the field as a project manager, um, not a big background in higher education, but I enjoy the benefactor relationships first and foremost. They can sometimes border on friendships, not quite, but to see someone who's been very successful in their career and their life, realize their passion that fulfills a need for the university. Um, it's just really very rewarding. It, you know, I'm, nobody gets into this job to make a lot of money. So that's a quick aside there. Um, but to be able to see people who really been financially successful uh, 
put their resources behind something that they're also passionate about and me helping the conduit for it. I've just, that's, it's been the best. It's yeah. been the best part. So one thing that I hear a lot when I, when I go to conferences, I meet people that work in fundraising is they, and I say, I used to work in higher education fundraising. If they're not from higher ed, they say, ah, uh, like you have an unfair advantage because you know, your donors, a lot of them, most of them being alumni of the institution, they just have this emotional connection that the homeless shelter or whatever else the organization might be doesn't have because people were at your organization at your at this university for probably four years. And that was just a formative time in their lives. And in America, a lot of times, you know, your alma mater is a second identity, you know, for whether that's good or bad, you know, we talk about, but there is almost this unfair advantage that it probably does exist when it comes to raising money for higher education. And it's just, you know, a perk of, of working in that world. Um, but your jobs allow you to connect donors to these institutions that they have such a strong affinity for, especially at places like Stanford and Notre Dame, right? Can you just each share a story about a time that you help the donor achieve their philanthropic goals and feel free to leave donor names and keep this anonymous by all means. But can you just tell a story about a time that you helped a donor or a donor family really achieve their philanthropy and kind of like Bill, what you just said, like you were a conduit. I, I love that word. Like, could you just each just share an experience that you find, found really, really fulfilling as the fundraiser? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on this one um, again, because this is a family that I know from the Dallas region who uh, every time I see them, it's a big hug. It's really like I've been out boar hunting with the husband. Like, I mean, maybe a little too, too close to this family, but um, they were a family. Just their background is they had started a scholarship. They were about halfway through paying it off. And it got to the point where they were kind of like, well, so what's next with us? He had graduated from. Uh, Notre Dame with a degree in economics, and they had supported a lot of veteran initiatives in their time. And so I got them into a capstone class that they were supporting in the economics department. And then they paid that off, and then it was what was next for that. And this was a family who didn't have a big set of defined goals. They weren't a long history of big family money. This was a self-made family. And so they, they, you know, they weren't steeped in the tradition of philanthropy in America. They weren't part of the Carnegie family or the foundation or any of these things. So they, they were kind of discovering how it worked with me. And um, they wound up, I was pushing them towards another economics thing. Their son wound up attending the school and they just got deep into to Notre Dame. He was an alum and now a parent. And uh, he wound up funding um, this International Security Center experiential learning because their son had been part of the program and they just loved the professor, they loved the center. And it was, like they did three times what I ever thought that they were going to give. It was like, it was just a great, great experience because they got so engaged with it. Um, so I don't, I mean, you know, without working the numbers or anything, because sometimes you get lost in the size and, and stuff, but the meaningfulness of these people giving a much bigger gift than I had ever anticipated and they had ever given before when they called and told me they were going to do it. They're like, well, what do we do now? Like, do we tell this person or do we tell that person? We've never done anything like this before. And so that was just super rewarding for me personally to see them hit this sort of thing that I don't think they ever had a goal of giving that much, um, but they, and they've since just loved the whole experience of it. Oh, well, that's great. Thanks for sharing. And, and certainly a, a great gift and an effective one because that center is doing really, really great things right now, as, as we know. Kyle, do you have a, a story to share? Yeah, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a beloved uh, faculty member at Stanford Law School uh, who passed away and um, an alum who's a major gift donor who I know quite well texted me and said, what can I do to honor this, this professor? She was my favorite professor I ever had. I still think about some of the things she taught me. Um, and I knew that in order to 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 fulfill that that goal, it would be two or three times as much as he had ever given. And because we were naming something, we'd like 
the money to be paid up front, not as in pledges because you don't want them to pull out halfway through all those things. So I talked with him several times. We had our dean talk with the um, the surviving members of the professor's family. We we're able to connect that way, um, and he ultimately did give the gift that was about three times as much as his last gift, and it's to permanently endow um, a scholarship uh, in this professor's name that'll be in perpetuity. And so he loved that he was able to. Um, have this name attached to a student every year. Additionally, Stanford doesn't give out any merit-based scholarships. They are all need-based. And so every student that gets funding, it's because um, they otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to attend the school. And so he um, was opened up to this world of endowments. He'd only previously given um, kind of general fund support. And so it was just a great example of, of showing an individual that your, your gift can live on forever and help other people's legacies live on forever on campus. And so that's uh, pretty recent. And that's one that um, was really meaningful for me and the donor. That's a great story and a great tip for people. I know when I was at a smaller university, um, when a professor would retire, it was a really good fundraising opportunity because we just talked about, you know, people are just emotionally attached and they just thank that professor for changing their life and, you know, their career. And so it's a great way to not only, you know, do some great fundraising, but truly and appropriately honor um, academics. And so that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and, and so, another, sorry, John, one other thing too ahead. is that's a great way to, to expand beyond your alumni base because faculty members have so many other connections, whether they worked as professionals or through their own circuits. So you can raise pretty significant money outside of your alumni base, which is typically the hardest money to raise. We do have that built-in base, but then convincing someone who went to Notre Dame to give money to Stanford is hard. But if they have a great connection to the professor, that's, that's a channel there. So we've had some success there too. Interesting. Great. So fundraising for higher ed allows gift officers to create and utilize just really phenomenal stewardship opportunities, right? Things that other organizations just really can't do. You have beautiful campuses, you have events, whether it be the arts or athletics, um, reunions are really powerful, right? Or we just discussed, you know, faculty, maybe it's introducing um, donors to a faculty member who's doing amazing research, right? Um, but most importantly, you have the opportunity to introduce or give donors time with students, even if for a short period, right? Um, could each of you share an example or two about stewardship ideas or things that went really, really, really well for you in your careers as far as bringing out that emotional appeal, I guess, with, with the donors? Kyle, you start us off. Sure. Um, everything you mentioned, John, are huge. Um, reunions. Uh, Stanford has a really robust reunion program every five years. Uh, it's not like 10, 15, 35. It's every five years for every graduate. Um, wow. Really high turnout. Um, so those are great. One specific example, which I actually have coming up in a couple of weeks, is um, the, the widow of an alum who passed away and left a sizable uh, eight figure gift to Stanford. Um, part of that gift went to what we call postgraduate fellows. So uh, after someone gets their JD, they get funding from Stanford to go work for a nonprofit or government organization for free to the organization. And so this endowment pays out their salary. So they're able to really make a huge impact. Um, and so the uh, the widow of the, the deceased alum um, is able to meet the two recipients of the gift every year. And so uh, she, I'm going to join them up in the Bay Area. They're going to have uh, the, the um, donor's wife is going to have dinner with the two individuals. And she's, she told me she was really open about it. She says, you know, seeing this work getting done by these, this next generation um, just fills my heart with joy, knowing that my husband's legacy is living on, not only on campus, but to, through two individuals who are going off and doing great work in public interest. Um, and, and these are Stanford, they all could go out and make a lot of money immediately working big law. And so for this funding to allow them to apply their skills to public interest is, is really crucial to our mission too. And so um, I've loved that opportunity and, and trying to really focus on ways you can connect one off with these principal gift level donors is, is really important for us too. In addition to every five years trying to get them on campus where the weather's amazing. Our campus might not be quite as nice as Notre Dame, but in late October, it's like 70 degrees. And so we do have that going for us. But um, it, we always try to get people on campus too, just in general, but um, focusing on the, the very specific examples has, has worked well for us as well. So in October, I would say Notre Dame is a better campus, but in January, I'd rather be in Palo Alto. So the leaves <laughs> turning, all of that stuff, that is that is great. But uh, you're right. I mean, we should hold our reunions in like January in Palo Alto. Right. 
<laughs> we'll or, have that or, on, yeah. on Notre Dame. Or February. You'll have yeah. that on us too. The longest yeah. and shortest month in South Bend I've heard. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, well, yes, the campus is great. And, every, you know, every weekend, you know, we don't do a homecoming football. We just do football. And every weekend is homecoming to see friends and stuff like that. So there's, that's sort of the classic, you know, obvious thing when people are coming back on their own. Um, I, you know, I think you also mentioned the student engagement aspect of it. Um, and you, you can't force a student engagement or an inauthentic student engagement it doesn't necessarily work very well. But we have a program where kids who have received some need-based scholarship will generally write a thank you note. It doesn't have to be a huge letter, but just, it's so simple. I went to a, a benefactor's house who had initiated a scholarship because his wife had done it at her alma mater and he was competitive. And he's like, if she's giving money there, I'm giving money to Notre Dame. And he had never really done any of this before. He'd just given to the annual fund. And so he initiated the scholarship. And after two years of it being active, I was over for a visit, we had dinner, and um, he's like, oh, I got to show you this letter I got. And he starts reading it and he just starts like his eyes start welling up with tears. And I didn't have this guy marked for a very emotional guy. And it was like amazing. And he's yeah. since, you know, done five times that with a scholarship and a simple little note. He's like these students. And it was also when he was a student, they had just gone co-ed in 73. So it was like it was this like the, the women you know, that got enrolled at Notre Dame when I was there added so much to the conversation and so much and, and so this young female student it was like the, it was just amazing so like it, it it's not you know when we talk stewardship people get all, a lot of fancy ideas about well I gotta make this special touch right. and make, like if you just do the simple things well with stewardship you could really knock it out of the park and it's just not just for more money but for the meaning that it makes for that gift for that benefactor it's worth everything. Yeah, I think people overlook the simple stuff. And in full disclosure, I still work part time at Notre Dame and teach a course on philanthropy. And our course is supported by a few alumni. And I just send them a Christmas card that is a picture of the students. And I have all 25 of them sign it. And people always write me back immediately and say, they say, thank you so much. This is the best card I received this year. It's on my mantle. I just love this. Like, and again, that's really simple to do. It's going to Shutterfly and making a card and having my students sign it. Um, so yeah, I think I think people do overlook the really simple, basic things. Um, we could talk more about, you know, what I think. Don't, doesn't Notre Dame do things, creative things with like the woodworking and stuff like that too, Bill? They use old stadium seats to make certain things or what's funny about that is i had in my bag before i gave it away in green bay a plaque from a bench from you know we we change our stewardship every once in a while we've gone mostly digital but we did used to have the wall of little plaques of tiles and so when they were taking that down everybody got them and i made a plaque out of an old piece of the stadium bench for a former football player who did a scholarship so like yeah. that, that's kind of a fun little thing that is sort of a one-off you're not going to get anywhere else um so some of those stewardship touches that are you know we have a grotto if you're a catholic and you're so or a person of faith at all and you come to notre dame's campus you visit the grotto and it's we take it for granted because it's such a touch but like this actually the same benefactor who now i've transitioned territories now works with another family had surgery pancreatic whipple surgery we sent him a grotto candle and his wife called us you know all like just in tears practically saying this is so meaningful to him this is going to help and so we i mean we have like again we have sort of a special grotto i know kyle's been to south bend and probably seen that himself but short of that really just doing the things in an authentic manner that aren't right forced or fakey or anything like that i think authenticity is something you don't want to try and fake right um and, and it it just it it makes it more meaningful for them not because it's a big payoff or it's something they couldn't get elsewhere but i think when you everyone's striving for meaning when you get that feedback that it really makes it more meaningful for you i think the sky's the limit yeah I have some more questions for Kyle and Bill, but if people have questions, feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A box, whatever's easier for you. 
Um, so you have both demonstrated really sincere loyalty to the institutions that you've worked for, um, which is really rare in higher education fundraising. When I was at a, a college working in the Chicago area in higher ed fundraising, I think the average tenure of a major gift officer was about 18 months. And it was just people constantly going off to the next thing to either get a title increase or a pay increase or to go to one of the schools that just has a better reputation. And that's that's really sad when you think about the nature of what fundraising should be and relationship building and talking to someone. But again, the two of you have really stuck around um, at the institutions that you work for. What are, what are the benefits to that? Like, what are the benefits to just sticking at one place for a while? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start. I've only, like I said, I've only ever been at one place. Uh, this is the only place I think I could legitimately do it. I used to live in Austin, um, not Austin, Minnesota, but Austin, Texas, which is everybody's favorite town in America who doesn't live there <laughs> um, <laughs> because of the traffic. And I had considered or approached trying to do it at the University of Texas. I probably could have been okay at it, but it wouldn't be the same for me. Um, the longevity aspect of it, our university comes with a certain credibility. Stanford comes with a certain credibility. I could go to Stanford and be there for a week and I would have some inherent credibility. But upon further meeting with a donor face to face, they would know I've been there for a week. What could I possibly know about Stanford law? What could I possibly know about what Stanford means in the community? Um, or in the world like so at Notre Dame over 10 years I've met people in the community I know department chairs I have personal relationships with people outside of fundraising that I can say I know this person I know these people I've been around I see what the priorities are and how they've evolved over the years and it, it it'll help you know it just it builds a ton of credibility and I think that that's what you're doing in fundraising is saying we credibly can use your resources for good. And I've been here and I've seen them used for good and we're going to be good stewards of that gift that you've earned over your lifetime. So I feel like credibility is super key. And and again, I you know, there's a, a lot of credibility with someone who would leave the greatest town in America to live in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'm clearly committed or I should be. Uh, so credibility again, that, credibility. I don't know if I could say that enough. <laughs> Great. Kyle, any thoughts? Yeah, I certainly haven't been as loyal as Bill. I've, I've been at Stanford for five years, including a one-year gap where I did work at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. And so <laughs> we're we I guess, in a different world. <laughs> Bill and I would have been colleagues there. Um, we say at Stanford that onboarding for um, field fundraisers is three years. Um, the first year, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know any of your portfolio. You just are trying to stay afloat. The second year, you're swimming, you're dog paddling, and then the, the, once you pass go twice, you start to get the hang of it. You start to know which faculty members are um, are most involved. You start to know where to go for central resources for those of us that work at specific units on campus. And so I think kind of once you get to that two and a half, three year mark, you're really on your own. And before that, you really don't know what you're doing. You don't know where to go. You're constantly not knowing answers that, that uh, alumni have in um, when they ask uh, during visits. And so... Um, yeah, I think once you kind of get to that mark, it's it just it really it really helps you get a get a firm grasp of it. And I I, I don't have any association to Stanford besides working there, but um, I've only been called out for that a few times. But um, so far, uh, things have gone all right. But uh, yeah, great. Um, we both touched on this a second ago in this last question, but my next question was, um, your jobs involve working with faculty, you know. Quite, quite a bit more than I think a lot of people would realize who don't work in higher ed fundraising, that you need that sort of those connections to the academy. Any tips for how people can build those connections to professors? Kyle, you have any magic sure. tricks? Sure, yeah. I would say um, over communicate with them, uh, assume that they don't know anything. For example, last calendar year, I put an email out to a bunch of people in my portfolio to see if they wanted to give a gift at the end of the year. And one responded like, yep, I'm gonna give a gift to this specific center. I'm working on it right now. 
I immediately emailed the the professor that runs that center and said, okay, do you know that this alum is planning to give a gift? Do you know where it's going to go? And the professor said, yep, I've been in communication with him for the last six months. I, I fully know. And so um, it's up to, to you to really kind of play air traffic control on there and make sure that everyone knows what is going on because you don't want to surprise the faculty member with a gift for something that they can't execute. Like, oh, here's a gift for this program that you haven't done in six years. Now we can't use this money. So I would just say over communicate, assume that the faculty member doesn't understand the fundraising process with um, gift agreements, pledge agreements, how the money comes in, the time of year it comes in, just really over communicate that. Um, and worst case, they already know and they ignore it, which happens a lot. Most faculty members do not reply to emails. Um, but I, I think just over communicating and assuming that they are at an, an understanding of zero to just kind of make sure you're, you're between the donor and the faculty member. Great. Well, well, leaning into the longevity aspect of it, when I came in, I was like, the plan here was long haul for me. So I got invested in spending some time, especially over our sort of non-visit COVID time. I know we had to say COVID at least once in this um, <laughs> webinar, but during that time, I really got more invested with people that I was interested in learning about their research, uh, just learning about what they do at the university. I also, to Kyle's point, every individual I would, I would just get coffee with people, ask them what they studied. You know, if you were a student and I have some college students right now, my advice to them is to spend, go to, in the first three weeks, go and talk to a professor, ask them how they got interested in this. And then you're gonna get the benefit of the doubt the rest of the semester from this person because these people have given their life to it. So to be credible with them, again, the majority of them don't know how this thing works, this thing called fundraising. They have this vision, I guess, of it's all steaks and cocktails and a lot of back slapping and the money just pours in. And, and if they just say what they do, then they're gonna get you know funded at a $10 million clip or whatever. Um, so I will help coach them up and say, well, really you know, work it through your department chair and work it through, you know, however the politics or how, however the money flows at each university, if you have some knowledge of that, help them coach it, you know, coach them to do that. I never promise anybody a rose garden or anything like that. Yeah. So I just, a, just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with people that I could go to any part of the academy and say, I really trust and, you know, acknowledge this person. So if I have a benefactor student, potential student visiting, I could introduce them directly to a professor um, in whatever field they're interested in. So mine is more of just my approach is similar in a way to the benefactors. I just, it's a one-on-one, -on -one, the more people I know, the more I can introduce to each other. Excellent. So some good questions um, here in the chat. So one person's asking, can you share some best practices for getting face-to-face -face meetings with donors who are non-responsive or that you haven't been able to get in touch with? Um, especially if you're new to major gifts. Any any tips that you guys could share? I was going to ask that question myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> you're, uh, you're helping Kyle have the answer. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, from my perspective, and, you know, our office has grown a lot since I've been there, threefold practically, which has meant shifts in portfolio, shifts in regions, and all that stuff in you. You know, you go go where they want you to go. So I've shifted portfolios two or three times in ten years, and um, with varying degrees of people being known and not known, and responsive and not responsive. And I, I found nothing is more valuable than one person in a region that you get to know very well, that trusts you right away, that introduces you to people. That I yeah. mean, personal introduction to non-responders. It seems to be the only way for me to crack it. Yeah. What about you, Kyle? Yeah, I think that's great. Going kind of triangulating it with people that they trust and the people people that you know really well is great. Um, inviting them to regional events, um, sending it as a, as an invitation without a like oh, I'd love to grab coffee. Just say oh this event is going to be in your area. Perhaps you'll attend. Um, and then because I work at a specific unit on campus, our, uh, we can bring in the big guns occasionally. Our, our Dean, Jenny Martinez, is really open to uh, meeting with alumni. And so two days a week, she has open on her calendar to do Zoom visits and occasionally in-person visits with alumni. And so 
Um, the response rate uh, to meet with the dean is five times higher than meeting with a random person they don't know. And so um, we can utilize faculty members, deans, um, if you can, if they're available to, to hop on Zoom or travel, uh, that is all, also great. But um, occasionally it's if if you know the if you know the person a little bit and they've ghosted you you can kind of draw on the common interests for example uh if someone's really into stanford football i can just send them an email about the football team having nothing to do with my role at stanford law school and maybe they'll respond and get back a few times and, and then i'll say like oh, i'm gonna be in your neighborhood you want to grab coffee that's worked for one individual that ghosted me for about a year but um, I think this is the multi-million dollar or occasionally billion dollar question in our industry is the response rate. We've noticed they're way lower after COVID. I think people mm -hmm. are just over email or something. They're just not as engaged. The response rate is lower. The, uh, the openness is lower, not just because of COVID caution, just in general, they don't open as many emails. And so um, just try new things. If they don't respond to long emails, send a one sentence email, just try to mix it up as much as possible. Have a coworker if if you have any overlap. Like I work closely with our annual gift team. Maybe have that person send it out. Maybe the new name will spark something. Um, just anything, anything and everything. And I think none of us truly have the answer, but uh, that's what really is a lot of our job is managing that and trying to get the visits. Yeah, yeah and I, mean, it's a, it's I saw a, you kind of a, nodding when he said COVID. Did you do you have that same experience? Right. Well, I was just seeking the affirmation from Kyle that people are not <laughs> responding because they don't like me. It's because if something <laughs> happened over COVID, um, and <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, it's been less responsive since COVID. Um, but the person who asked the question is hit right at the heart of the matter. This right. job is all about getting in front of people. The work itself, <clears throat> I'm like, the work is getting people to see you. And when they right. do see you, it's, it, there's always something. There's always something like Kyle mentioned, you know, the things the things that I try to, you know, it's not a, a neuro linguistic programming type of thing where I get this, I push this button and they respond in kind by giving me some gift or I, I get them to touch, feel, see those kind of things. It is so much more about just getting in front of them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I found some of the similar things like Kyle has said, you know, uh, trying to keep a list of, I mean, for people who've non-responded me, who I who I do actually know exists as a real person, um, I'll send them an article, you know, once every couple of months about because the universities do everything right, and there's yeah. they're constantly in something. And I know the one thing that makes that person interested in our university, I get them that information, and they'll respond. Um, I could talk about football all day with them, but I try to avoid some of that. Um, Although I am very excited about playing Ohio State in a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's going to be good. I think this is the same person that asked the last question, but he or she is asking, what are some good daily or weekly metrics to strive for in general success? So I think that, you know, coming from this world myself, working in higher ed, I think it's pretty common that most of us have quarterly, you know, metrics or goals. So this person's asking about daily or weekly metrics that can help you strive for general success. Any ideas? Is it number of phone calls that you make or emails or even visits? Any thoughts? That's a great question. It I've is. never broken it down beyond, like you said, quarterly or even monthly. Yeah. I think thinking of your portfolio in the bigger buckets of stewardship, solicitation, cultivation, and discovery, thinking of those four categories and making sure that you're moving it one, two, three, four people in each of those categories at any given time. I know like towards the end of the calendar year, we get really bogged down in solicitations. And so keeping an eye on stewardship for people who maybe gave in the summer, those types of things. I just, I, I kind of keep those four buckets in mind as I go about my, my day to day. Um, but God metrics on the day to day, that is, that's hard. Uh, Bill, any, any ideas for, for daily metrics? Well, I mean, it's we're close to the start of the fiscal year, so we just, you know, made it through the July, um, and I committed to myself to have at least one phone call that wasn't about anything every week, um, and I, you know, have that as something. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very big goal or anything like that, but I find that if I don't make that one call specifically to talk to somebody, just reach out to them. Uh, 
a non-ask call, a non, just kind of out of the blue without, you know, um, I, I feel like my, my week gets more organized around making sure, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make that call on Tuesday and then I'm going to wind up having better success planning out my trips because it's, it, for me, the personally is a, it's a churn job and, you know, I don't measure the number of emails I send out. Um, I do measure how many visits I get planned for three weeks out. Um, and if three weeks out, I don't have four on the calendar, I get nervous about that trip. Right. If I have three, four, and I know I can work in another five, six in the next two weeks, I feel good about the trip. So, it, I mean, it's kind of based on travel for me because I, I go in region a lot. I don't, I don't live in the region. I go to the region. Um, so I would, you know, it's not a, a very good, or obviously I don't have it measured very well. Um, John Rockefeller with his measurement system wouldn't be very happy with me as an employee about how I'm measuring myself, but really I made it a goal to have one sort of just touch point call at least one every week. If I can get more better. But um, I feel like when I'm in more contact, more regular basis, more personal level with people, um, I just do better. Um, I get more visits. More visits always mean more progress and gift discussion. So, Great. Uh, another question. This is a good one. They're asking, how often is ideal to meet with one donor or the donor family in one calendar year? Is it, is it it's probably not the same for every donor. I imagine every donor and family is different, but any general thoughts about how often you're meeting with someone in person? I, you know, that's, again, it is fairly, uh, and I've done it both many ways. Like I've been in where we were out every two weeks and I had a portfolio of 150 people and I was visiting people, you know, I want to make it worth my visit. I want to make it worth the money I'm spending in the university. I wind up over visiting some people, maybe yeah. see somebody four, five, six times in a year in their region. And you just can harbor on um, getting into the friend zone if you over visit a little bit. Um, and it's like, oh, this is great. You come out and see me and we have lunch and this, we'll talk about football for 10 minutes and we'll maybe talk about what you want, but like, it's great to see you. And so I wouldn't say any more than three times, two, three times a year. If you have something working, if yeah. you don't, if you're in a, just kind of locked in a stewardship mode, you know, just make sure that you see them at least once a year. And if they're coming back to campus for an event, try and see them there, but don't pound them. Um, I don't know. It, it, again, it's very personally motivated. It's also on the flow. Like, Kyle was talking about the, the standard case sort of designations of cultivate, ask, steward. Um, you know, if they're in the steward, that's always the best cultivation. But, you know, you, all at the same time, you're not out there. I mean, they know what you're there for in general if you've done a good upfront job. So I don't know. I've done it both ways. Um, I'm trying less visits again, maybe by the nature of nobody wants to visit anymore. <laughs> Um, or I have an, a less responsive portfolio, but um, I feel like it's better investment and it, it keeps it at the benefactor level instead of the benefactor friend level. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Kyle? I, I, I really appreciate the way you said or the way you brought up over visiting. Um, you know, you could, there are some people who would take any visit anytime, but if you're seeing them once a month, there's no real updates coming out of your university. Um, there's no real life updates usually at, at that frequency. And uh, yeah, you fall into the friend zone, um, which is good or bad. It, it's, it's good that you get to know them that well, but it, it makes it harder to, to then have the, the philanthropic discussion sometimes. But I would say in general, um, once a year, once to one to two times a year, if there's something really cooking up that is going to involve a lot of back and forth and going back to university and going back to them four or five times as needed, but that's going to include some phone calls, some significant email conversations, but yeah, you don't want to see someone in person 10 times, 12 times a year. Um, and you'll, you'll also 
discover which alumni want to to meet once a year like that's enough for them 18 to 18 months is good enough for them they're still going to give they're still going to do everything um and going from there and i like how you said tracking them down at events if they're on a board or anything like that on campus you can say hi to them and maybe grab a drink or something but um yeah kind of finding that sweet spot i would say kind of one to two times a year for most alumni so another question right now kind of a sub question what we just talked about how are you balancing in person meetings versus zoom and online visits um and you know as far as your strategy um i guess what they're kind of getting at in the question can a zoom visit be a visit or is it difficult to talk about high level philanthropy over a computer screen versus being with someone face to face i, I like this question a lot it's a great question you mind if i go first bill yeah, go ahead. yeah please so we, during COVID, um, through our official metrics, made Zoom visits count as, uh, we call them virtual visits, so they count the same as an in-person visit. And I think because of the nature of, of so many people's work cycles, they have been making business deals on Zoom, they've been buying houses on Zoom, they've been making investments on Zoom, that it, it became part of their culture too. And so we've had good success cultivating and soliciting people on Zoom. Um, it, it gives them better access to our Dean, which I had mentioned a couple of questions ago. It's much easier for her to hop on a 30 minute Zoom than fly to Phoenix and stay in a hotel and try to get other visits in when there's not that much of a pool that's worthy of a Dean visit. And it's a ton of time for her too. So um, being able to utilize faculty and the Dean is much easier on Zoom and they are much more receptive to just hopping on a screen with a briefing as opposed to traveling. Um, and so in many ways, I feel like Stanford has done a good job of moving the needle, utilizing this technology. We also can get visit credits if we have significant phone conversations, significant text message conversations, um, anything that really moves a, a, an alum or donor forward, we're able to count. And we found success um, using all of these things, depending on, and with younger alumni, if they have the capacity, they probably would rather text message than meet in person anyway. And so um, right. for some of the next gen um, alumni, mm -hmm. we have a lot of wonderful people who have started companies and had wonderful investments and they're 27 years old and have are already in major gift portfolios it's 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 better to have that blend i'm uh i luckily have not had to utilize snapchat or tiktok to fundraise yet but in the next few years look out for it's film coming <laughs> it's be the next trend yeah we'll have a webinar yeah. on that in a couple of years about using yeah. tiktok to uh connect with your donors bill <laughs> uh, i would say in a similar fashion we had we had logged visits um, via Zoom as a regular visit. Uh, personally, I'd had some success, and I think Kyle pointed uh, something, you know, it can be a very impactful visit when you bring a dean or you bring a professor or whatever. Um, those have been made much more normalized by this three or four person screen, which is, you know, has been helpful. Personally, I've not reached out. I know some people in our office have reached out to people they'd never met before, and their first interaction was a Zoom. And that, to me, is, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a dinosaur in this, but it just, like, I, I have a better face for radio than I do for this. Um, I'm not well lit. I, I never had the camera, never makes my chin look any less fat. Um, <laughs> so I, I just... Uh, thousand percent prefer the very first meeting or phone you know sometimes it's a phone call or trying to get into a meeting but just really the first interaction i've always tried to make in person and i just i struggle with you know maybe that's something i need to overcome for the future or maybe i never see a person again and i just text these 27 year olds that kyle has <laughs> in, in the leadership portfolio um yeah so it's it, it's an interesting and it, it's definitely in the future going to be a blend it's yeah, I can not imagine that we go back to, you know, oh, everything's back to normal. I just I don't right. see it happening. I mean, even for groups outside of this, like I, you know, meet with the men's group every once in a while. And it's a Saturday morning, 7 a.m. I've got to tell you, it's a lot easier to get to my chair and be presentable this far up than it is to get to some other building. Yeah. So I think just in general, uh, meeting on Zoom is perfectly fine. I feel connected to Jonathan because I know him actually. So maybe this is. I'm talking myself into it because I really am enjoying the heck out of knowing Kyle now. And <laughs> we've never met each other in person besides this. So, yeah, I agree. For first visits, it's a little more awkward in person. Um, 
or I'm sorry, it's a little more awkward in Zoom. I definitely would prefer to grab coffee or stop in their their office and get get a feel of their body language and how open they are and and what level of the conversation they want to go on the, on in that very first meeting. I it can be a little awkward on Zoom for the very first time. Yeah, right. So speaking of first meetings, this is a good question too. What are the most important things you hope to find out about someone during your first meeting? So let's assume it's like a half hour coffee, you know, appointment. And if you're lucky, it goes a full hour because the conversation is going really well. Yeah, I I think overall, if there's one thing, it's how much do they, how, what is their affinity level for the institution? Like if if I can walk out, because I've met with people and they're like, listen, I went to Harvard for undergrad. I give them all my money there. I'm never going to give to Stanford. I like what you did. I didn't, I liked my education. I just not interested. <laughs> it's like, okay, then I, you know, but if they say I loved it, I wish I can go back more, you know, you can really start to tap into it. And Stanford has a really kind of donor centric um, relationship building approach to fundraising. We rarely ever make an ask at all in the first meeting. Right. Sometimes if, depending on the conversation, we might not get too deep into philanthropy unless they've given a small gift and I can grow off of that. And so I think just getting a feel for their affinity toward for the inst- institution is great. And then um, just building trust in me personally, I think is is one B for that. Um, can they come to me and ask questions in confidence um, that I can answer those types of things? And so I think that's kind of what I look for in a first visit. Great, Bill? Yeah, I would say uh, similarly, I'm trying to build trust as immediately as I can with a story, a little bit about who I am. Uh, you had prepped us with the question about one book you might recommend. And uh, this is not a fundraising book. It was called The Story Factor by Annette Simmons. And I forgot to bring it so I could hold it on the screen. But uh, it's a little bit about storytelling and not so that you're constantly talking about yourself, but it's so that you can if you don't, if people don't know you through a story and they know you by facts and figures, they generally have an impression of you before you walk in. And it's not usually good. Mm -hmm. Um, Just the default story about fundraising is, oh, I know this guy. He's going to come in and tell me how great it is. And then he's going to take our money and I'm never going to see him again. And they're not going to spend it the way I want it. And that's kind can be kind of an embedded story because people have negative story in their head. So I give them a story about, you know, I grew up on the youngest of eight children. I went to the University of Notre Dame. I graduated, blah, blah, blah. It's a short story. It's not about talk about myself, but it is to try and displace their story. So if I get 30 minutes, I want to know from them, um, I mean, do they trust me through body language, through would they take another meeting? I also want them to know what I do in a short version, like, I try to help people create a legacy that they want and it should lead to a lifetime relationship with the university and a mission that they love. That's right. what I'm trying to do. The mechanics of, I ask for this type of gift in this type of range and blah, blah, blah. Those, those are the mechanics of it. But what I really do is help them build a legacy and I want them to know that. And when I do that, you know, I'm not asking them for money the first time. I'm like, look, you know, we have a little more runway at the university to find what you're most passionate about but I really am asking them the first time I visit them should I come back and see you and would you like this to continue you you know who I am you know what I do should I keep coming to see you and when they say that they're basically saying yes I would consider a gift I would consider doing something meaningful for the university and so if I had 30 minutes you know again classic sales would say never talk about yourself Never do any of these things, but this isn't classic sales. We're not selling widgets. We're not selling a fleet load of Ford F-150s. We are trying to get them to trust the university and us as the conduit to that university to do something meaningful to them. So that's what I'm looking for, trust. That's great. Um, So Bill mentioned, I was going to ask you guys um, a book or an essay or an article or anything that you'd recommend for others working in fundraising. And and Bill answered that. Kyle, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I don't have anything as far as specifically for fundraising. I think the book uh, From Good to Great by Jim Collins, a Stanford professor, is is wonderful. Um, Spoiler alert, but the, the main thesis is that 
great leaders are humble and have a sincere connection to the mission for the place they are working. And so um, people might think that the the, mo the person with the most charisma or the huge personality ultimately wins out, but it's all about being humble and loving what you do and loving the institution. And I think that that's important for fundraising. It's a great book uh, and has nothing to do with fundraising, but I, I got a lot of lessons from that book. Yeah. So two more questions. And uh, this next one is, do you have any tips for higher education fundraisers when it comes to crafting gift agreements? Uh, I would say, again, this is probably biggest gift I ever booked. Um, the person inside the academic unit, you know, I got them to agree before the agreement came out. They said, yeah, we're going to do this amount. We want it to go for this experiential learning. And the person came back with some pretty in-depth language about how it was going to go or, or what it was going to go to. And I said, could you just simplify that down? Because it's like a two-page boilerplate sort of thing. And, and you know, designate something, but not, not over-designate. Because the worst thing you can do is say, hey, let's set up a scholarship about something you're really passionate about, like students of your classmates. And then... Right. That sounds all well and good and people are really get behind it. But then 15 years from now, there are no more students of your classmates and you the unintended consequence of over specifying something for somebody 40 years from now who's never going to be able to spend the money is, you know, and, and people want to do the intent. There are some people and, you know, there are these guys make money in business dealings um, who are really interested in getting it over specified and super detailed. And if you can walk them back a little bit and say, look, the intent is to do this, we're going to do it to the best of our ability, but these endowments are meant to last for just as long as the university lasts and we intend that to be forever. So right. if you can think of it as a future need as well as the current need that you're really so simple, I guess I overstated to make it simple. I don't know that's I, I think simple, but asking yourself and your donor, is there a need for this in 50 years or 100 years or later, right? It's like when you when you see that there used to be um, degrees in Soviet studies and, you know, it's like, what do you do with the degree in Soviet studies, you know, now in this day and age? Uh, Kyle, any thoughts about gift agreements? I know it's not always, the MGO doesn't always get the final say about what's in a gift agreement either, right? There are other people that are helping you craft these. Yeah. But any general thoughts? So the interesting thing about Stanford is after the Varsity Blues scandals, um, MGOs aren't allowed to work on it at all. We have a legal team. We have an intake form where we fill out the donor's name, the, the amount of money, all the details, we send it to them, and then they spit it out. So it my, made my job a lot easier because That's I hated nice. writing those things. I <laughs> hated going back and forth with it. So uh, they're actually within our plan giving team at, centrally at the university. They do all that communication for us. So um, as far as actual advice from when I used to have to write them, create a good template. Um, let the donor know that this is not, at least at Stanford, it's not a legally binding contract at all. And I'm dealing with all lawyers, so they're always going to question that. Um, and to let them, and just really kind of create uh, is the most general language that you can. So if things change, you can, you, so if you say European studies, that's mu that's much more inclusive than Soviet studies, a country that hasn't existed for decades. And so like we have one scholarship that has to go to a student from this rural California county that we never get anyone from, and we have not been able to use that money for decades. And so, um, being able to open, and you can't go back and change it. The donor is probably deceased, you know, those right. things. as general as possible. Make sure that there's an existing fund, like work with your finance team to make sure the fund exists and, you know, and the faculty and everything know exactly where the money's going. But, um, broader is better, though. So. Or in one, uh, just a quick follow up on what Kyle said. Um, uh, ours are kind of a boilerplate. We don't create them either. We have someone who actually is responsible for writing them all out. Yeah. But we and we send a little blurb about preference. Now, one thing that we do for, on a scholarship that has helped us avoid that is a tiered preference. So instead of that one person in Temecula, right? That you're trying to <laughs> you're trying to get a lost student out of Temecula. One comes out every decade. But if you said first preference to a student from Temecula second preference to someone from Southern California, third preference to student of greatest need. That's kind of our catch-all um, on a scholarship or whatever the program. 
Yeah, and that's great too for estate gifts because ideally we want the estate gifts to come many, many decades from now and the costs of things are different. So, it, uh, you know, preference for a professorship, those are $6 million now. I don't know what they're going to be in 20, 30 years. Second preference towards five scholarships, you know, those types of things too. So the tiered system is is wonderful for, for current, for, for any endowed gifts or for estate gifts. Great. Last question. What advice would you give to someone who is considering a career in higher education fundraising, specifically major gifts? Kyle, I know that you were in corporate foundation world for a while before transitioning to major gifts. Any advice you'd give to people who are considering this, this career path? Yeah, so we are doing a lot of hiring. We just finished a lot of hiring for, for MGOs and on our team and annual, annual giving people at the law school. And I think the, the one thing that I look for is can this person go out and meet with people and be likable? Like if you are, if you feel that you are generally, you can do well in crowds, you can do well in one-on-one -on -one visits. It's ultimately about making a connection, building trust. And so um, if that is your personality type and you feel you can thrive having seven visits in a day, you're tired, you're jet lagged, you boom, 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 back to back visits, you're sitting in traffic looking for parking, you're going to be five minutes late, inevitably to one of the meetings, and you have to apologize for that. Right. Um, I think if your personality type is designed for that, you will do really well in, in the individual giving of any type. Um, and I previously worked in corporate and foundation relations. If you find that you're much more, more kind of rigorous and structured and you love cycles and you love specific due dates and you love that, I think CFR might be better for you because major gifts, yeah, we have calendar year, we have fiscal year, but there's no timeline for a lot of these things. And, you know, gifts take years to develop or they can take weeks to develop. And so depending on your personality, I think that you'll, you'll fall into one type of giving or another. Great. Bill. Uh, my, my piece would be um, some personal patience because Almost everybody who gets into this role is highly competitive. Um, they might have come from a former sales role and they're competitive internally, externally, but the person who drives themselves and puts more pressure on themselves than anybody else is going to put on them, this job can kind of eat up a little bit because, um, you know, day by day, you're, you're talking a little bit about daily, weekly metrics. You know, this isn't a day to day, week to week job. Um, and if you can be patient with yourself and patient with the relationship, I'm not saying, you know, take the month off. I'm saying take the expectation off this being something that's front of mind to a donor week by week where it's front of your mind because you know this has to come in. But um, the transformational gifts don't just happen just because a 27 year old has a big bunch of paper money. It, it, they happen because they trust your university. They trust you to help them do the right thing with it. Um, and so sometimes that takes a long time. And even a first major gift from somebody, it could be the most money they've ever given to anybody. And it doesn't seem in, in the era of spreadsheet charting and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to higher education, a $100,000 gift doesn't seem like that's going to scratch the surface or be meaningful. It could be the most meaningful thing ever to that person. Yep. And it could be harder to book a hundred thousand dollar gift than it could be to book a five million dollar gift. Yeah. There's no measure of how hard it is to get those major gifts, or we call them leadership gifts. But I would say be patient with yourself. Be patient with relationships. Um, again, you're probably super motivated. You're super driven. You want to do good, but it does nobody good to get overly frustrated and start beating yourself up and start doing the things that are you think are going to make things happen this week versus next month. Yeah, that is great advice. That brings us to the close of the hour. Thank you so much, Kyle Conover and Bill Kemp for being with us. Let me just plug two events really quickly for people still with us. So on August 23rd, we have a webinar hosted by our very own Jack Fowler. Jack will be talking about education reform, where are donor dollars most consequential? Again, it's August 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern, free webinar with American Philanthropic. Also on August 25th, we have one of our master classes. Uh, this is a master class on major gifts. Uh, it's about acquiring, retaining, and upgrading your, upgrading your most valuable donors. That's August 25th at 1 p.m. You can find this information at AmericanPhilanthropic.com and click on the events tab. With that, let me say thank you one more time to Kyle and Bill. I really, really appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Again, thank you so much.